And there we go. Okay, well, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, this is John Jay, uh, Thursday, February 16th. And uh, we're just gonna talk about the process you would use to remove um, an IRS notice of lien, let's call it. The notice of lien kind of sticks. The notice of levy is being used to take property. So the notice of lien, it kind of bothers people. Um, it doesn't, it's not being used to take your property, but still it, it's intimidating. So and sometimes it's in the way and sometimes it's unfair. Now, uh, to, the way you communicate with the IRS, let's go to that form real quick. So you can see I've already searched it up. Now, when you guys see the URL, I'll tell you all I did if I go if I go back here. This is all I did. I just searched on this phrase. I mean, I just made this up. I just and here we go. I mean, I ended up with the dang form. It comes right off the IRS's website. And I like to use their forms. You do not have to use the IRS form. I recommend you do though, because you're dealing with robots, real or not, I don't know. But if they, they like to see forms and the forms collect all the information that's gonna be necessary. So um, the way I used this one is I'm applying for withdrawal now. It's talking about the 668Y. It's a notice of federal tax lien. That's all I'm talking about here. Uh, you fill this out, your contact in info, and there's gotta be a reason, okay? now. There's probably some check boxes. Now, the one I just did for a gentleman, this is the one where we ran the clock on the IRS and he's got like, it went up to like $850,000 and it expired and he never paid it. And now he doesn't owe them. <laughs> All right. So we have to clean this up because they're not going to help us. Sometimes they just don't help you. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe some of these don't apply, but basically what you're looking at is, you know, one or more of these check boxes. It might even say only pick one. Oh, it says all of them. Okay, yeah. So, but anyways, you would just read through this. But what what I end up coming down to is here. So, like in his case, um, so we, you know, the lien, the notice. Let's call it the notice because this is not the lien. This is just the notice of lien. Their actual lien, they don't have a lien, by the way, but they act like they do. It's a collection of transcripts, and that's another subject. But we're just going to call it a notice of lien. So the notice of lien is expired under and then you would just put something like you know you don't even have to do this much you know and also it just as it turns out it actually is under the internal revenue manual and it's sickening that i actually remember this from the internal revenue manual you know but anyways you i just, think it's brilliant <laughs> well you know it's there i mean if you want to look it up but uh you just tell them look guys i know what the law says and uh, uh, it says that according to the date on this uh this obligation is expired and so the notice of lien, they, well, I think what they do is record a release of lien. So you're going to see the notice of lien, and then you're going to see a release of lien. That is legally sufficient to allow like a closing company, like a title company, to not deal with that. They're not going to say, hey, you have to pay off the IRS because they can see right next to it or, you know, it's been released. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is how you'll, you'll, you'll get help is if you know, get this off of the record there. Now, a so a couple things happen with the notice of lien. You might see it in the, in the mail. Uh, but probably before you see that, it's going to appear in your county recorder's office. This is really what we're trying to do is to get the satisfaction of lien or whatever they want to put up there on a release of lien uh, on the public records also. So it cancels. They each cancel each other out. Now, that's why you get these letters all the time from all these parasite law. law oh, yeah, that's what they do. They pull up all these liens. Um, so the, there's another way, too. You don't have to be in a situation where you ran the clock on them. You could be like. Um, well, I've been in situations where uh, the client could pay the IRS. Um, sometimes it makes sense to pay them. Sometimes it makes sense if they'll agree to a payment plan. If the IRS will actually remove the lien, if the IRS does not remove the lien, it'll impair his ability to pay. And so for that, we that would be in box 12 here. You would just explain how, first of all, either the IRS or the government would not be prejudiced. That's what you, so you have to have some sort of fact as to showing why it would not be prejudiced. Maybe because you have a deal with them, right? Maybe um, you're, it would facilitate your ability to pay more or something, you know, whatever. Well, or, can you um, explain what you mean by the government would not be prejudiced? It, um, like, for example, their notice of lien is just like anyone else. Anyone who wants to make a claim on you um, is in date order. So whoever makes the claim first gets to have the priority claim. So if the government has made its claim, it has a, a, a position in time. And if it were to release that lien, it would lose its position in time. And if it did so in a way that 
jeopardize the collection where the lien before was securing its ability to collect and it removed the lien, even if it brought the lien back, maybe you could tr complete the transaction and then get the money first before the IRS could get it, right? That would prejudice them. And so it has to be that set of facts to where it wouldn't create a prejudice. In this case, I'm showing you it expired, but sometimes you can present the facts to show that it would not create a prejudice against them for collecting. Um, and also another version of that is if the lien is inhibiting you from the ability to either pay or make an arrangement to pay, right? So, and there may be some other situations. I'm just saying, this is what you would do. You're trying to get it off of the public record so you can get on with your life, okay? You can get around it, but it's nice if you can get this out of there, right? Now, so so that's, which, that's a public record. What's that? Which box would you check for that? If it's... If it, um... Okay, like withdrawal to facilitate collection of tax. See where I put the X here? Yep. That would be an example, right? And and sometimes, I mean, someone's going to read this. So, I mean, you can put in language here at the bottom, it, you know, you, you sincerely believe that it would not prejudice the United States. Um, what's this one? Taxpayer it did an installment, right? Uh, and the lien was imposing the agreement did not provide for a notice to be filed. Okay, so that's another interesting thing too. I mean, if you got into a payment plan, that's why I always recommend doing an offer and compromise because now you're documenting the terms. Whereas if you just call them on the phone, most people just call them on the phone and they're, they'll say, yeah, sure. You know, they'll make a deal with you. And then you're stuck with that deal because if you change that deal, like if you don't pay, they'll never make a deal with you again on those tax periods. So if you do an offer and compromise and you get the people to come to the table that are qualified to talk to you and make a formal written agreement, you could be, you know, foresightful enough or insightful enough, or we want to call it. And hopefully this, you can make sure this provision is not in there, right? That you're going to do an installment agreement. And the part of the agreement is that they're, they don't, you don't agree that they can file a tax lien. You see? I mean, they might catch that and say, yeah, but we want to, <laughs> you know, and you can say, well, I don't want you to. And, and then you have to explain and say, well, if you do that, it's going to inhibit my ability to keep on paying you, right? So you can kind of negotiate that. So anyways, this is the tool. And, and of course, here are the instructions. It tells you where to send it and the criteria and all these things. <clears throat> so they always do that, all right? So the other situation is, Let's say I've, I've had this so many times where the husband, for whatever reason, you know, he owes the IRS. It's something he did exclusively, even though the couple was married a long time before that and they filed jointly. But uh, the debt to the household was solely due solely to the husband. And then because he was whatever, for whatever reason, he's uncollectible. OK, IRS can't take his money. So what they do is they take the wife's money from her tax refund. That's the easiest way. So the way you would, the way you would go about dealing with the IRS is you would you would file this request for innocent spouse relief. And who's shuffling around there, guys? Come on. i got to go find my thing and I got to mute everybody. Who's doing that? Can you just mute mute yourself, please? <laughs> I have to stop what I'm doing and find all the mute buttons. Uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So um, that, that's it. I mean, look, you got all your instructions and everything, right? And I'll just go over this in a second. I know it looks lengthy, but this is like you're dealing with a machine, so you kind of have to do it. Remember, we always make fun of the IRS. We dread the IRS, but realize that they're just doing an accounting function. I mean, really, we don't like the fact that the IRS has police powers, but, you know, that is a problem for everyone, but it is just performing an accounting function. And all this rhetoric you hear on the internet about the IRS going away, it's never going away because the IRS is the accounting function for the United States. It will always have an accounting function. You can call it anything you want, Ernst & Young. You can call it IRS. It's still gonna do the same thing. The problem we have with it is the police power that's for the most part abused, <laughs> you know? Um, so you have this form, innocent spouse relief, and I'm going to back up just a little bit and I'm going to show you, see, again, it came from the IRS website, but look here, you've got the actual form that I just showed you and you've got more instructions. I don't know if they're different than what's already on the form, but I'm not going to click on that. But you see here, I mean, this tells you everything. So, yeah, we just get to 8857. Let's just jump over there real quick. So I'm not going to go through the instructions, but as you can see, you're going to identify the tax period. 
um, you know, your contact info, and they're going to ask you some questions. And see, they're going to try to qualify because sometimes it, you don't qualify for innocent spouse relief. But I can tell you that most of the time, if you just answer this form truthfully and accurately, you're going to get it if you're innocent. I mean, if you had nothing to do with the debt, you're going to be fine. So that you don't have to try to, you know, persuade them or something. Just tell the truth. And you can see it's, it's kind of lengthy, but um, how you're involved. They want to make sure there's a complete separation, you know. Um, what kind of knowledge do you, did you have about the situation? They want to make sure that you're not benefiting from this in any way, which is kind of, I guess they have to do that. Yeah. And they're not asking for more than they need. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really about that one situation. So now here, yeah, they want to look at your stuff too. So uh, that's another reason not to own things. I mean, whatever. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's say they uh, levied your, you know, the wife's uh, tax refund for a couple of years. This form is written so that you can go back and get the money and recover it. And so what I'm saying is you might be able to reorganize uh, your stuff so that you can answer this in a way that's actually favorable to yourself. That's what I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, look at this. Oh, I guess they have to ask, right? I mean, but you've already told them this for the most part. They want to look at your living expenses. That, that's like the 433A. Well, maybe they're basing the decision on how it has affected you financially, right? Which really, in, I just think it's not fair that you do that if you if you were innocent you were innocent it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire <laughs> just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you should pay somebody else's debts even if he's your spouse you know so anyways yeah i i think this is but this is what you have i mean if you don't use this form i mean it's going to be kind of difficult i mean just the, it's great that they have this form because otherwise you'd have to go to a tax attorney he'd probably charge you several thousand dollars to write up this document mm -hmm. so there you go i mean you got you got to give them some credit that they at least you know they, they do these forms so easy enough you guys can probably guess at that and uh find it on the internet the one i want to show you though is on your credit <clears throat> so there's three bureaus that everybody talks about it's equifax like transunion experian okay um big subject i mean there's a lot to talk about there but there's about at least let's just say nine consumer credit reporting bureaus so what is a credit reporting bureau okay an example of that we don't talk very much is one called checks systems c h e x systems and check systems is kind of an interbank credit reporting bureau agency that polices um whether or not you owe a bank over here uh, a fee for something some transaction and then you're trying to open another account at a separate bank different brand and owe their buddies over here, like you owe Chase, but you're trying to go with um, you know, Bank of America, check systems. The bank will always pull the file from check systems to see if you owe a bank like a $50 fee or something. And they'll tell you either pay our buddies or we're not gonna open your account, <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like a lean. So what the reason why we know this, okay, what qualifies a credit bureau is that it is regulated under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So check systems is one of those reporting bureaus. So we all know Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. So here's what these creatures do. Um, when you ask for a validation on something or a verification of a credit item, you're trying to dispute it, okay? What they'll do is they will, they will look at your credit file and see if maybe there's some collection of information on your credit file that justifies them reporting the item. And they'll tell you that it was validated if they can do that. Like for example, if you had several versions of your uh, address or several addresses that um, you don't use anymore, but somehow it leads them to conclude that you have an accurate item in there. And even if it's not accurate, you know, they'll, they'll leave it there. Uh, <clears throat> what they'll do though really is they don't go to public records. Equifax to validate or verify something Will, va will verify it through another regulated FCRA type reporting bureau. And I'll give you the, the prime example, it's gonna be LexisNexis. Okay, so LexisNexis is under the FCRA, just like Equifax. It's just that it, 
people don't normally interact with LexisNexis, but Equifax does. And when you dispute an item on Equifax or TransUnion or Experian, that company will simply contact Trans or uh, LexisNexis, and LexisNexis is already obtained the same information that Equifax had. Okay, so it's like um, verifying with yourself whether or not you're crazy. <laughs> what crazy? is FCRA? Huh? What is FCRA? Okay, the FCRA is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Okay, that's in oh. that's in Title 15 of the United States Code, and it's under Section 1692 and 1691, 1694, somewhere in that area. Okay. Okay. It's Thank all you. your consumer credit protection laws, thanks to Ralph Nader. In the 70s, we got all that stuff. Nobody ever uses them because they don't know about them. <laughs> even lawyers don't even talk about it because they can't make more money if they talk about the actual law, which mm -hmm. really is, you know, frustrating. But anyways, so Fair Credit Reporting Act. LexisNexis is the reporting agency in the background that Equifax and TransUnion and all those guys are verifying your item with. It's redundant. Of course, they have the same information. This guy verifies it. Yep, it's valid. <laughs> so... What you do is you, first, you have to scrub your file. So you pull your file and you remove any redundant information, misspelled old information, uh, second spelling of your name. It might be both correct, just remove one. Leave only the most, let's say, the least amount of information. One version of your name, one most recent address where you reside um, or whatever address you're gonna give them. No versions of that, no misspelled street names, things of that nature, no outdated things. Outdated would be probably antedating the report by more than seven years, but you can even tell them it's not accurate and say, I don't live there, never have, they can remove it, right? So reduce the information footprint as much as possible. So this might take a month or two, okay? You might go back and forth. A lot of times I think you can do it online. When you when you subscribe online to a reporting, make sure that it, if you go through Equifax itself and you subscribe to their online you know credit service like their free report, the problem with that is you have to agree to waive your right to sue them under the FCRA law, and and that is a that's a big no no because you want to be able to sue them and you want them to know that they can that you can sue them for money, right? So you don't want to anybody who has a deal with them to pull their credit they. They, they waived it. So you're going to have to cancel that. And there's an opt-out provision. And there's another provision in there that um, subjects your disputes to binding arbitration. That's a no-no. You don't want to get into that. So what you would do is go through Credit Karma or something like that, some other service, and read the terms of service very carefully for two things. Make sure that you're not waiving your right to sue. And also that you're, I mean, maybe it might be the same thing. Don't waive your right to sue and don't agree to binding arbitration. And most of the most of the third parties don't have that in there, but Equifax does. So once you narrow the footprint, so let's say you have this IRS tax lien, this notice of lien in your credit. So the way to get it off your credit, I don't even care if you owe them still. I don't even care if you did the other thing or not and removed it from the county. Let's just say the IRS still says you owe. You can take it off your credit file. And that gets you a lot of things. That gets you through society, a lot of you know, car deals and all that kind of it's not gonna, it's if you have a notice of lien and it's on the county records and that's not released, that will come up in a real estate closing, but not in buying a car and getting a cell phone and renting a thing. Okay. So you're gonna get yourself a lot of ground if you can remove it from your credit. So now that you know they're just verifying with each other, you want you clear up your file and then and then you freeze your file. You can do this in about two minutes on the internet. Uh, you freeze your file with LexisNexis. And there's a few others. So you'll want to start investigating. And I have a list of them. And, and I'm probably going to do more detail on this. Once you've frozen your file, you then dispute the item on Equifax and demand a verification. And then Equifax will be unable to verify it because your file will be frozen with LexisNexis. And they will have to remove it. And they will send you a notice saying that they removed it because they were not able to verify it. Wow. Yeah. Even if you owed it, it could be a bankruptcy, it could be a judgment lien, right? That's wow, the that's amazing. Yeah. It shows you what a racket this whole thing is. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. to make us frustrated and, you know, exhausted and get a, get our money and stuff. So to make them money. <laughs> oh, you bet.
oh my gosh, it's just, it's sick what they're doing with our data. So yeah. but hopefully I, I gave you everything. I didn't want to talk too fast. I, I know there's some new terms in there, but that's the well, idea. You're going to put this online, right? So that I means that's yeah. or yeah. yeah. I always have to listen to your stuff twice, at least. <laughs> yeah, it helps to hear it again because it's new. So, but uh, yeah, that's about it. I also I mean, slow it down. <laughs> you know, and that's funny because a lot of times I watch other people's, you know, technical videos and I played on like 2X, <laughs> unless they talk fast, then I played on like 1.5 or something. But usually I'm like 2X and my wife comes in, she's like, what are you listening to? And they're like, blah, 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 blah. and I understand it. Because I'm like tuned into what they're saying, but she's like that. <laughs> that would <Yeah>. be me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, is there anything? I mean, we don't have to only talk about this, but if you guys have any questions, we can do that. Should we care about the oddball agencies? I mean, there's three main ones and there's LexisNexis that they verify against. Um, should we care about the other crazy ones out there? I know there's one called CoreLogic that currently. Yeah, CoreLogic. Just that, that's for real estate, estate, I think. Yeah, yeah, I would get. I would try to get a list. I think I have a list. I don't know if it's everything. Um, I'd have to go look it up to find out who they are. But yeah, I would look and look around on the internet and find out who all, which credit reporting agencies are the ones regulated under the Fair Credit <laughs> Reporting Act. If you were to look for that type of question, you're gonna. It's gonna show up on the internet. Um, Core logic. Core logic. Yeah, and there was another one that was acquired by somebody else, and they're still using both names. So. Yeah, that's that's the problem. When you try to freeze at core logic, they redirect you to the other place, but then the other place yeah. says we're not associated with them anymore, so we can't do it. So there's kind of a loophole there where you can't freeze core logic. Well, then they're breaking the law because they gotta they gotta allow you access. So I don't know. I, I haven't tried to go through like I'm saying, but most people that I I'm hearing this from and I'm talking to people that, that will follow up, they will go online and do this. So uh, I think online is your way to go. It's way faster. Well, I just, I just tried it today. The, the CoreLogic website, they have two options. You can print out a form out in, or you can call yeah. in. Um, oh. But both, yeah, right. Both of those options to redirect to the other place first, which they're not working with anymore. They don't. So they're, currently, they're just breaking the law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we, we're running into that stuff. I mean, let's see here. I'm going to see if I've got CoreLogic. Yeah, there's another one like there's like nine or 12. Um, another one is, let's see, E Oscar. I'm looking here. Uh, yeah, E Oscar, Lexus, Nexus, Sage, Stream, LLC. Okay. I'm, I'm reading off my list. And I'm, like I said, I, I probably need to get this updated. Innovis is another one, I-N-N-O-V-I-S. Um, check them out, see what they're used for. I mean, some of these are relied upon by the real estate closings and some are not. Uh, ARS is another one. ARS-consumeroffice.com is the website. There, yeah, CoreLogic is in there. So anyways, I'm gonna come out with a more of a, a complete suite of strategies here uh, so that way like if you have to write a letter i'll just write the letter for you and then you could use my form letter so we'll get into that more uh, but yeah that's how you handle the irs thing and i mean you can do that with bankruptcy items or whatever i mean you don't have to argue with anybody that that's the thing i mean just avoid conflict if you can we got two hands up so let me pick uh peyton hi hi hey Thank you, John. Yep. Um, uh, my question is about uh, how can I file uh, an LLC that uh, isn't through the state? I think you mentioned sort of as an aside, a way to, to establish an LLC without uh, filing with any state. Is that, did I, did my ears catch that right? Or is, hey, is correct. So what, um, if you're going to deal with the banking system, you probably can do it. It's just that the employees will think you're weird. That's okay. Um, but at some point, they want to see that your your business is resident in their state. 
where the you're dealing with. The, the state or the, the bank. I'm talking about the bank. So the usefulness of your company is the fact that you can do banking. Now, if that's not the issue, then we don't we don't have that. We don't care. But for most of us, if to answer, I'm going to answer your question so other people can use this. So the bank wants to know that that company is subject to the jurisdiction of the state in which it is operating. So you would you could ask the bank, what can I do besides registering with the state to show that it's present in this state? And they'll say register with the state. But then again, you have to talk to somebody. So um, uh, the old way of doing it is to uh, publish it in the legal notices section of your newspaper or some other periodical. I mean, today it might be electronic, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then also <clears throat> having the name of your business, like if it's a brick and mortar or something, or it, maybe you got a billboard and it's a website, but you got a billboard. Well, then that might be enough where the bank would acknowledge that, okay, we're we're seeing that it meets the legal criteria for doing business in the state. You can also uh, look up your statutes that explain what constitutes um, business presence in the state. That's an important fact that we don't talk about too much, but it's in the case law. Um, if you can meet those criteria, which is pretty easy to do, then you should be able to get away without registering with the state. But remember, you are still, a resident of the state in the same way as if you register with the state, but that is the way around it. Well, are, are you familiar with David Robinson's work? I don't um, know. Okay, it's all about um, understanding your straw man, understanding mm -hmm. uh, your position with the state, uh, whether you're yeah. uh, the trustee or the beneficiary or the executor, yep. of your all that stuff. Yeah, I understand the subject matter. I've been studying that since the 90s yeah there's been, <laughs> there's, right been <laughs> there's been at least 40 people okay that i i know of that are the guru on that and i just i keep on studying it and but i don't use it for anything but yeah what is it what, what's interesting about it well what what's interesting is uh because i mean the way i look at the war that the way the powers that be uh they're not taking us down the right path to take care of the planet um, so I sure. want to do something uh, radically different, but fundamentally sound. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's uh, well, why. Well, there's so I'm many, doing. so many things you can be doing. My gosh, I mean, certainly uh, forcing people to have electric cars and use lithium batteries—that is a, the wrong way to go. That's ruining our environment. Mm -hmm. That's not helping anything, and because you're powering your car with coal now. <laughs> what's the difference or nuclear or something. nuclear is really the future nuclear and, and and liquid fuel like methane and gasoline that those are the future fuels not hydrogen hydrogen is going to be good but like i said um methane the reason i say methane is because the methane molecule carries the most uh, densely packed version of hydrogen so with methane we can use we can use methane for hydrogen is what i'm saying mm-hmm mm -hmm. Well, well, coming back to the topic of banking, you know, one of the hurdles or one of the obstacles we have coming up is the CBDC and uh, yeah. uh, how how might we uh, and I'm OK I'm, for that yeah. one. My first thought is you're going to end up with some if you could. I don't know if you can do this yet, but with technology, maybe you're going to end up creating a straw man. The problem that you may face is the biometric data. And I think there's a way around the biometric thing. But again, I don't want to participate in that system. So I'm really not sure which way to go yet. Yeah. Um, but I can see there, there's going to be some, we might just have to take that technology and set up our own way to use, you know, acquire supplies and get in business. Mm -hmm. So I don't know yet. Um, I mean, because right I mean, now- I have, I, I have a colleague that keeps saying, you know, don't file with the state because then you're uh, submitting mm -hmm. to all- Okay. Their nastiness. All right, tell your friend, I've said this so many times, tell your friend that because I use a lawnmower to cut my grass, I am not a lawnmower. I'm just using the lawnmower. <laughs> it's a tool. If I use a corporation as a tool to manage financial risk, it doesn't make me a corporation. <laughs> it doesn't do anything other than what it's saying it's doing. It's a person that's a fictional creature of the state and I'm using it to indemnify myself. Because the state is giving me the indemnification. The state is my tool. It's okay. a good thing. <laughs> it's not hurting me at all. If you don't know what you're doing, you can get run over, as you've seen. You know. Yeah, that's what I right. like. There's I know that. what I'm doing. There's that. All right. Thank okay. you. I should thank Peter and Terry.
Yeah, I can spin off a lot on what we're, what you're talking about there. So a lot of things are coming up uh, when we're talking about the whole fiat system where uh, we're going to have to look at alternative communities and the main things are going to have to be an economic system first and then food, water, alternative yeah. power, things like that. And there are people who are doing it, but we have to get enough people on board to really realize uh, what are we going to use for a currency? Well, we are the currency. Uh, and so rather than working with the central banksters, we have to come on over and look at what they're doing in, in the crypto scene. And there's many things with Monero, Darrow, things like that. Once we get enough people doing that, we look at El Sal Salvador, they're doing it. Uh, we're in Canada right now, and we just, we're in a community here in a valley in the mountains in British Columbia, and just to get people to go in that direction is very, very difficult. Very, very Well, El Salvador, all it did was hijack Bitcoin. It yeah. turned it into a taxable currency. It yeah. didn't help anybody. What's going yeah. to help, and I think people are going to realize that we're still going to need a banking function. We're yeah. just not going to want to use it to exploit people. We're going to need a, a, a way to borrow money. So here's what here's how it goes now. Consumers that need money, they just go, uh, or they want to do things in this in our economy. They they go and borrow from the banks, right? That's where it starts. So it gets originated like in a credit card. Okay. Well, why why originate money as a consumer loan when I can originate money when someone goes to retire? So why not why not use the the why not introduce new money into the into the economy? as people retire, because the population is gonna be expanding. I mean, if they're not interfering with it. So, uh, and also why not originate money when we need uh, public property developed? We need roads maintained and things like that. Why not originate the money that way? And instead of originating the money and, and just jamming it on consumers and just, they're getting money all the time. They're originating money all the time because everything they do is originating money, credit cards, mortgages, and et cetera, and insurance contracts, and even bank accounts are originating money. Why put that on us and let us and have us do it when you're going to inflate the economy and you're going to exploit us? Why not originate money when you're going to serve people? Then do we have a need for property tax then? Right. You know, based on their, you know. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be into that. Yeah, and yeah. we're going to have to kind of learn history a little bit, but we're going to still be left with a, a debt system. It just needs to be maintained. It's just like a 30-year mortgage is just a way to subsidize the purchase of homes, and then you're going to end up where we are now, and you don't have any control over the pricing, and it's totally not fair. When really, the building of a home, I mean, if you want to finance it, what's the problem with seven years? Why don't We don't need 30. What's the problem with two years? I mean, all you're going to do is drive the price down. You're still going to, I mean, the the monthly salary of people in Cuba is $15 a month. And they're, I mean, they don't have great conditions over there, but they get their food, they pay their rent for $15 a month because the value of the currency is higher. You know, that's just, that's just the society. So if you stop subsidizing things with consumer debt, the prices come down and they're real and they're more stable. You, you guys know that. But I think we can use cryptos for that. Sure. And, yeah. and, you know, I'm going to send you some really good information on a guy out of Britain who's actually setting this up right now. He's doing a, a phenomenal job, but we can be talking about this on oh, for yeah. the next couple hours. But where I was, my question I was going to pose to you, John, is uh, providing that a person's totally out of debt and doesn't have a mortgage and uh, doesn't need. So what it is, is preventing ourselves from being leaned out and becoming a secured party creditor. Uh, sure. Do you know much about that and how people can do that? So uh, if, if we're going to lean ourselves out, lean out the properties, uh, then, of course, if the IRS or here, the Canadian Revenue Agency is going to come in, well, they can't go lean out unless they pay out the lien. Perhaps you can expand on that. They ignore it. They ignore it? Yep. Really? Huh. Mm, okay. Yeah. That I've seen people do that. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't help them financially. The only way to actually use a lien is to use a lien that they recognize. I mean, it is recognized. It's in the UCC. It's adopted in all of our state statutes mostly. Uh, and and they just it doesn't factor into creating a priority. The way you do create the priority, though, is actually use the court system. Now, like I'll give another example. Let's say I um, 
I want to strip equity from real estate. Well, I can protect a, a real estate piece of real estate from creditors that would have to sue me, but I'm not going to protect it from the IRS because the IRS has a, a priority over judgment liens. So in order to protect from the IRS, I can't own it. I have to convey the title. So even then, I mean, and the state itself has a priority over the IRS. And I think mechanics liens are over the IRS also, <laughs> you know? So yeah, so so they will use that, but but the uh, security agreements that people file, if they're even if they're done correctly are completely ignored. Um, I, and maybe it's because people don't know how to use them or they can't find a lawyer to do it because the lawyer's not going to help them. But I can tell you that the banks use them and the banks use them for commercial loans, you know, uh, because they're going to foreclose on people's interests. I have a client right now they're doing that on with the security. The, they are the secured party creditor. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that when people do that, you're last. I think that's why they're being ignored is because you're last. You did it after the fact. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go to the next one. Okay. Uh, Taylor, thanks for your patience. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, I have a problem. Well, it's not really. Well, I have a good amount of money stuck in, um, in it's in uh, crypto. And uh, I don't really, I don't know how to move it into an LLC. Uh, without using my own personal uh, social security number account. <clears throat> like I could move it into Robinhood, but then Robinhood will uh, put down the transaction occurred, even if it's US dollar, because I'd be swapping from uh, a stable coin into um, fiat. And um, they put that down on the 1099. Like I have one, I have a Bitcoin transaction that um, is just down on the 1099, but, Basically, um, I'm wondering what I can do to um, put my, move money into the LLC while remaining. Um, yeah, don't use that exchange. That's going to force you to sell. Just don't use that exchange. That's one way. Another way is open an account with that exchange as an LLC. Well, I've, I've, I've been trying. I've been looking into that, and a lot of these exchanges they require um, your personal uh, name and social security number when you make any account. I know that's okay. Just make sure the account holder is an LLC. You'll be fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought um, if you open up an account, even if it's under an LLC, and you provide your social security number, then um, it could well, some way tie back to you. They, they um, do that for collecting your information uh, because it's know your customer type stuff, but the account holder is what has the liability. So just make sure you're the signer for the account holder. That way you have zero liability and the way the account holder works, it can also have zero liability. Okay. Yeah, so see if I would just try and, uh, try and set up an LLC and then uh, there's no drama after that. Otherwise, you can use other exchanges, uh, even Caleb and Brown, just move from coin to coin and then you can wire it out, try to get it out of the exchange somehow. Uh, and now I have, I, I work, my, my partner has an exchange he just set up a few years ago, actually. We've been using this and we can do large amounts. We can do up to, I think, $7 million uh, per client per day going from crypto to dollar or back and forth. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Go to precious metals too, if you want. And, and by the way, uh, they don't send up, we don't do any 1099s mm -hmm. and we, we set it up so what the whole thing's really anonymous. Nobody knows anything. Um, and we don't even give out the website information because it's private. It's like a you know a private club. So if you want to, if you want to do something like that, there is a premium. They're gonna charge you like eight to twelve percent, might be more, but you're not gonna end up with like a 39% liability, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, I'm definitely interested in that. Uh, where, do you, where do you want me to message you? You can email me or Telegram. Telegram is, you know, uh, at JJ Singleton. And just let me okay. know you, you want to check it out. And you can look at the fees and everything. You can even talk to them on the phone and see if you want to do it that way. I use them, actually. I use that exchange to um, go in and out. <laughs> so. Okay. All, All right. right. Good one. All right. And uh, Brett, what'd you have there? Yeah, how you doing, Jay? It's... Uh... 
So I'll give it a wave here. I sent you a message on Telegram, but um, short oh, short version is uh, I you created one of the um, blockchain trusts for me and the LLC. Yeah. And I was going through all the docs, and you said in there that uh, you need to have LLC on the the IRS EIN letter, and I just realized I don't have it. it doesn't say LLC on it. Okay. So I've got just a tax issue. Again. What's yeah. that? Apply again. So so apply again with the same name, just with LLC in it. Yeah. This, and then I'd have to completely update. different. Uh, uh -huh. Did you already give it out to somebody? Well, yeah, I mean, the bank chase. So we've been running a business for two years. Okay. And so all you do in that case is you would just give a new W9. Okay. That's it. To, to who? The bank. Whoever is going to be the payor, whoever's going to report your company. Okay. So if my, business, if my business partner is putting 1099s in right now, I should tell him to hold off and give him the yeah. new uh, EIN. Yeah. Less is better, right? Good so to know. you want the EIN assigned to the company with the LLC designation. That will create the separation and just notify everyone of the new W-9. And, and I assume you've been acting accordingly, so that's fine also. And if the IRS ever had a question about it, say, well, if, you know, that's just, you know, it's obviously not that person, you know, so it won't be a problem. Okay. And uh, I mentioned to my business partner and, um, you know, I'm a big fan of what you're doing and uh, love what, uh, what I'm reading. He, um, you know, so sorry for the, the curveball here, but he said he had a friend who did a PMA in a, I guess it was a religion or a church, but uh, they, they sort of disagreed with his strategy and uh, he went to jail for a year. So uh, I just want to make sure I'm doing the There's right thing. There's got to be Maybe. something else going on there because just using a company in this way doesn't create a crime. So okay. I don't know what it has to do with me. <laughs> no, 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 nothing to do with you at all. Just the, yeah, the PMA yeah. in general. I'd so, like to know uh, what his what his deal was. Like, what was he doing? Because yeah, uh, me too. Because <laughs> I yeah, won't so, do it. <laughs> yeah. What was that? Okay, I'm not going to do that one. Right, right. Yeah, no, they probably were doing some shady things. But um, all right, cool. Well, and uh, I think that's all I had. I let's see, EIN sole proprietor, and uh, reason yeah, not include what is decent size. Yeah, so I'm I've got a negotiation with the IRS and did the four three three A and everything. I just okay. want to make sure they don't come back around and they're like, hey, this doesn't pass muster, and we're not going to do a pay schedule with you so sometimes they will say that but the, they also may ask you to make some adjustments or something they might tell you why you want to uh, get a reason as if they don't accept your offer because it can be appealed you always can appeal things yeah all administrative yeah just keep that sounds in mind. good yeah just to know so, sounds like i'm in the right room here everyone's talking about crypto and i've been shorting bitcoin the last hour so I've been <laughs> greens all, all right. right all right <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, and, and by the way, just um, yeah. as far as I've been doing this, I've never had a client come back later where it, what I did created a problem. So, mm -hmm. uh, so far, so good. Uh, that's been since, uh, let's see, 94, 1993. Okay. So, so far. Yeah. Good. Um, good. Thank and you for I that. Ho hope you enjoy the book. And uh, if you ever want to remember that I sent you the book on internet marketing and after your son there. So, yeah. yeah, I gave it to him and I totally forgot about it. I said, I gave it to him first. I should go ask him because you know how you do with your children. You're like, hey, people you like to thing? discover things for themselves. So he probably yeah. just put it somewhere. So and if, anyway, if it is like that, it. if it's gathering dust, I'll just have to go read it. Hey, Thanks we, call for it shelf, me. we call it shelf help because people usually buy it, put it on the uh, shelf and never read it. Please. Anyway, I know, I know. all right. Thank you. All right, Kevin. Hey, um, yeah, I opened up a online bank account um, with Relay, which is part of Thread Bank. Mm -hmm. And they just asked, I, you know, I did KYC and they asked for just a EIN. Um, so I emailed them and asked them, I said, well, I want to make sure that, you know, my PMA is, is listed as the owner and I'm the authorized signature of that PMA. And I, I, I gave them my, my EIN document, my, my W9 and all that. And I don't think they even looked at it. And they finally came back to me after a couple correspondences and they said they said unfortunately we cannot show another company as the owner of the bank account for this company as we always require the information of the direct end owner um you are the end owner and we will reflect this in our system hence this is why both the ssn and the ein are required the ssn is to verify your identity and the ein is to verify the company <coughs> Okay. Um, and that's just where we're, where we're at. I don't even, 
Yeah. Well, you got to think this through. First of all, you shouldn't you shouldn't open a can of worms. You shouldn't you shouldn't have called contacted him and talked about the PMA. You should never talk about the PMA. No. No. You have an LLC. That's it. Okay. Uh, Especially with the banks. Now, I would ask the person I'm working with. Then, then do you have any customers that are businesses? And are those businesses owned by other people or businesses? Because chances are, it's they are. And so, ask why you're being treated differently. Is it good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so how would I, how would I ask them as far as if they set it up right? Because they might have. I don't know. They have me down as Kevin Campbell as administrator. Look, it doesn't matter have, what the banks. You know, and then, the the bank's I, records do not establish ownership of your company. This is what I'm saying. This is not a conversation you want to have at the bank. It doesn't matter what they do. The only thing that matters is what's filed with the state. That's why we call it the Articles of Association. That is the law of the company. It's what is registered or published. They, the bank can say whatever it wants. And you can tell the bank. In fact, we even lie to the bank. We say, I'm the 100% owner of the PMA if they ask, which is irrelevant. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so so basically, I'm, I'm okay the way it's, it's set up right now. Then. Sure. Yeah, as long as I open the account and tell them anything, because okay. your articles establish the uh, rights and liabilities of the owners and your beneficial interests, and has nothing to do with the banks. Now the banks try to, you know, collect information to help out the IRS and other creditors you might have let down the road, but uh, right. the articles would preclude them from doing that. So really, you could just tell the bank anything. You can even amend the articles later. Okay. Oh, yeah. Man, because you, you could tell them one thing one day and the next day you can amend the articles and what, they're not your business partner. You don't have to tell them that you did that. And if you did it every day, I mean, it's just a ridiculous thing that they do. They try to police everything. But if you think it through, you realize they're, they're treating you differently than anyone else. I mean, I'm sure they have investors where those companies are owned by other businesses. So how are you different? It's like if, if an accountant for IBM is opening up a local branch uh, banking service for IBM who's coming to town, right, or Walmart, the, who's going to open that account? Probably an accountant. The actual accountant is going to use his SSN. He's going to sign for it for IBM, an international computer company, right? Well, why, is, why does the bank right. not have a problem with not knowing who all the owners of IBM are? But they have a problem with you. Right. And why okay. is the, maybe the accountant doesn't so, own IBM stock? Why is why is the accountant required to be an owner of IBM in order to open an account? It doesn't have to be. And they're doing it to you though. You're saying I'm only the signer, and they're saying, Yeah, but you have to be an owner. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. All right. So so basically then if I'm using this account and if I hook it up to my personal account somewhere else, or if I wire money from a personal account into this account, does that create create a trail that the IRS can follow or the trails don't matter. They're gonna be there, but will they follow it? it, No, Uh, but but don't connect your personal account to your business because you might create the right to offset. It's like, uh, okay. you know what offset is where the banks just take your money out because you owe some other branch of the bank. Right, right. But yeah, if you bleed them right, in, like, if you treat them that like a personal account, the bank will have a right to treat them like a personal account. So just, I'm not sure exactly how the inner workings are, but I always recommend against that. So some sometimes that just means you can't have a convenient thing. And for me, I'm good with that. I'd rather be inconvenienced, you know, and, and have my money protected. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah, you're doing everything good. Just, just don't, just make it simple. Don't try to have a conversation with these idiots. I mean, they're smart people. I'm, I'm saying, but yeah. they, just, they just really, they're trying to do the right thing at their job, but they're kind of like uninformed, right? So. Okay. Don't provoke. Yeah, they, them. They're pretty friendly with me, actually. Yeah. They, they weren't bad. It's just I just want to make sure that everything was done right. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, less is more. <laughs> if, if they're going to go and do it yeah let them do it you know <laughs> all right thanks for that one yeah uh, i'm going to go to john here all right, so thanks your thing john what you got hey uh actually maybe you don't want to answer this because this might have been before you started recording <laughs> but um 
you, you mentioned something about using a vault instead of a bank to be more um, safe with private transactions. Can you talk more about that or is that too private? No, I can mention that. Um, I uh, sometimes have a situation where I have to move money for a client or show them how to move it or he's, he's money's locked up somewhere. And so I like to use a vault service. So if I'm doing something internationally, um, I can wire money between vaults because they have to take money. And many times we get the bonus of being having access to other currencies. And I can do this in any way I want. And the vault service, I can even do it in my client's name uh, because the vault service is not part of the banking system that's reporting on people. It's a vault. It's It doesn't have a banking license, put it that way. That's why I like Halo and Brown. I don't know even how they're classified. That's one what's example. That? So what? what's, what's, that, what's that company called again? The account? Yeah, you said something in Brown. Yeah, Caleb and Brown is in Australia and it manages uh, cryptographic currency for clients in, in a, a very traditional way, uh, like you would for securities, but it's not a banking facility or a licensed bank. So it's not under the same rules or treaty restrictions like any other bank would be. Meaning that if you're dealing with it as an individual, you're not on the radar, so to speak. You're not being reported to the Financial Crimes Network all the time or the IRS. <clears throat> so and, and I, yeah, go ahead. So you could like send crypto to them and then have them pay someone else in their local currency? Not exactly. You could do it that way, but you got to work something out. They have some rules. So the rules are, an example, uh, whatever account holder's name you're using in Caleb and Brown, you can only send to that account holder somewhere else. So you can get money out, but it has to go to the same account holder. You can't just pay a third party. Now, with other vault services, you can do that. I've used them for settling things, too, like a big transaction. I can I can close a deal somewhere in a, a foreign country that's outside of the jurisdiction that the deal is taking place. So you have no tax situation then. Um, as far as trails of paper go, <laughs> your transactions, okay, guys, listen, <clears throat> everything can be seen. Not only that, but everything can be seen forever, like probably back to the 80s. So here's a crazy example. I pay someone $1,000, and then that person takes out of that $1,000, <clears> he buys his groceries, and then... Uh, pays the utility bill and then whatever. He spends the money and then the people he spends the money with, they combine that money with other people's money and it goes on from there. As you can imagine, it's this craziness, this path, right? Well, there is software that's been around for decades that can map all those transactions, every single dollar, every single penny and show you where it went and where it came back. It's like, it's like playing the weather in reverse. If you video recorded the weather, play it in reverse and see where all the raindrops came from. They can do that with our money. And there is no $10,000 limit. It's not $3,000. It's anything they want and we'll never know what that is. It's some algorithm and they're tracking. And I can only tell you this by reverse engineering what I'm seeing. They're, only, they're tracking unusual amounts of money. And if it's unusual and it's $47, they don't care. If it's unusual and it's $4,700, maybe. Right. I don't know if that helps y'all, but <laughs> it's not like in Hollywood. It's they see everything. So that's why I like doing what I'm doing, because they can see everything and I don't care. Nothing's wrong with it. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that along the lines of what we were talking about? Because uh, I just I had remember from Kevin's question. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, vault services, I mean, <clears throat> if I can, I mean, here's another uh, hypothetical example. If I have gold in a vault, okay, it's, and I like the allocated vaults, right? So, so my gold is not on a spreadsheet. It's actually physically in a vault. Now that's what Singapore does. Bullion star, unless they changed it, they actually have allocated vaults. So my account, <clears throat> they physically have to go to a room <laughs> and they have to like, you know, move my gold somewhere, okay? And they have to do it on the accounting too. But if I'm going to trade with somebody, let's just say uh, I'm going to I'm going to trade a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars for something. Maybe uh, maybe I'm yeah. So the the person would have to open up another uh, an account at the vault service, 
where I have a vault service. Or if we don't, we both open accounts at the vault service, right? And then we can do our transaction through the vault service just by telling the vault service, hey, do this, right? So I can move my money from my account to his account or whatever. I can do it in cash. I can do it in gold, whatever. In the vault, in that country, completely off the grid, okay? So we can buy and sell real estate. We can do commercial transactions, you know, all these things, whatever you can create, whatever you can imagine. But that requires the other person to be interested in using the vault as well. You can't just like sure. tell someone, hey, you have to use this vault service a little bit. Like, no way. <laughs> pretty much. Well, yeah. yeah. It's going to be that special transaction where you're pretty much going to be on the same page. You know, usually people that think like this are going to be open to it or they'll be impressed. They'll like, they'll be thinking, oh, OK, I never thought of that before. We could do that. Yeah. Hey, let's settle this real estate transaction in Seychelles. <laughs> Why do we have to settle in New York? Let's settle it in Seychelles. <laughs> hey, good point, good point. Hey, got another question for you. Um, do you know, um, so I've got um, you know, I've got a rejected offer and compromise at the IRS. Okay. And part of that process is you you know, you you pay them, you know, hundred dollars a month while they're deciding on it, right? And then they decide, no, we reject this, and I appealed it, they still rejected it, but I kept paying a hundred dollars a month, and that seems to be keeping them happy somehow. Is that a normal thing. Okay. I just, yeah. You know, uh, my, like, mostly, mostly my purpose in doing an offer and compromise is to get, 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 avoid a surprise levy where your whole account's wiped out. <laughs> or if you have a pension fund, I want to avoid that from being touched at all. Uh, so um, if, yeah, if they'll accept a payment and it wasn't part of the formal agreement and they're going to accept it, you don't have a commitment from them to not levy. But what you can do is if you're paying, I, I mean, I really think it's not fair that, that you, what you just described is not being fair to you. What you can do is open a complaint with the taxpayer advocate's office and ask if you can get a memorialization of the agreement because the agreement is I pay you $100 a month. You, you see what I'm saying? You already have an agreement. It's it's reflected by what you're doing. What you want is another agreement, another provision that says, and uh, we're not going to just try and levy your accounts. You can maintain your notice of lien and I'll keep on paying you, but don't wipe my accounts every three months. Well, I don't need to worry about that. Right? Took your and that can be avoided money. too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got, I've got, i got nothing in my name for them to take, so yeah. don't worry about that. But, I mean, well, I mean, I, but I do, um, I feel like I need to wait a bit. I figure, you know, eventually I can just fire, file a new offer and compromise, and eventually they'll accept it since I have no income, yeah. no assets. Um, yeah. But in the end, it seems like just keep paying $100 a month is keeping them quiet while waiting to file a new one and yeah. waiting to file a new one until I have a whole tax year with no income. Um, to kind of prove yeah. I'm really stuck. I think you figured it out. I mean, I would keep on doing that. And if you're in a situation where it's really hurting you, like it's creating a hardship, every time they send you a notice of lien or notice of levy, you can always do, uh, you can do a form 911. You can do a, you know, a collection due process hearing request. Keep on hitting them with those. And eventually you're, you're just going to wear them down because they have to stop everything when you do that. They have to get back the money and stuff. Yep. If you do it within the 30 days. so. You got that on there too. That's aside from your appeal on the offer and compromise. Okay, I didn't realize that was a third thing you do after that. I always do that. I'm the biggest pain in their ass. I mean, I just I I, I do a nine one one. There's a nine one one form. You guys know this? Yeah, Did I you know you mentioned Uh huh. Let me see here real quick. I mean, can you believe? I mean, that the government agency has a form nine one one. I mean, what does that tell you right there? <laughs> Let's see here. So if I go up here and I'll just show you what it looks like. I mean, it's really easy to fill. It takes like two minutes. So this is what I would, in addition to asking, like we're submitting a new offer. Like, I think you maybe they'll consider it after six months, I, I think. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm going to go to the IRS's website and get it. That's probably it. Yeah, there you go. You see that? You just fill that out and follow the directions. 
Uh, that gets you the tax for advocates. And then the other one is request for a collection due process hearing and just follow the instructions. Um, I have no, this one. This is a, you probably, well, I always start the offers and compromise with this form here, the collection due process hearing. You don't have to. Um, let's see, I'll go, I like the IRS's website. Yeah, so one, oh, okay, so yeah, it's a one, two, one, five, three. I don't know, you can find it yourself, but here, here we go. So yeah, I would do these forms. Interesting, so, so you would always do that just to annoy them? Well, even it is effective. I'm not just trying to annoy them. I'm actually trying to get the advocate involved and then the advocate is gonna review what the other, the agent's doing. And they, they sometimes coordinate, it does help a little bit. Um, so okay. yeah, it's not, it's, so you're not going it alone. Um, and I hate to say, I mean, uh, the truth is uh, attorneys, tax attorneys make it easier to get things done with the IRS just because they, they want you to have an attorney. You just have to be careful about what the attorney, that you should know what you're doing and you should be able to tell the attorney mostly what to do. You shouldn't be needing an attorney because you don't understand anything. You should use the attorney simply because he's an attorney and you'll get more respect. Mm -hmm. That's just how it is. Yeah, I hate to say. It. Sounds like you did pretty good, though. I mean, on your own. I mean, that's it's tedious. I can tell you. I know doing the 656 is ridiculous. It's yeah. worse than a 1040. <clears throat> All right, anything else? No? Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, thanks for your patience. Hey, okay. Hey. I always feel yeah. like I'm asking too many questions when I come on here, uh, but I'll, I'll try to be, be brief here. If I invest in personally in an oil partnership to get a tax break, okay? And when I get royalties, can I take those royalties and just put them in my uh, LLC? You can, uh, but just make sure that if you're getting a tax break, then, and you, so this is after tax money, you've already dealt with the IRS and now the royalties are just out there. You're not avoiding a tax this way, right? Okay. Well, I thought it, I, th yeah. I thought it was tax deductible, the money I put in, but when you get money back, is that, that's tax advantage as well? Well, you're okay. So if you're going to get income and it's not going to be taxed, it's going to be deferred. You cannot also get a deduction for that amount of money it's either one or the other either i think it's going to be deferred you get, you, i think you get a tax deduction for the money you put in for your initial investment you can yes. write all that off but i didn't know that the royalties you got so that oil well starts or, or series of well starts producing revenue back to you i thought that would be taxable because you got a tax break on the way in yeah you're getting a tax break on the way in okay so I think you could do it. I don't think I don't think there's going to be a problem because you can fund something that doesn't create a tax liability. So you're getting a tax benefit. That's a little bit different than a deduction. You're funding it and then you're managing the royalty through a company. You retain the beneficial interest the whole way through. I don't think that should be a problem. Until I realize, until I dispose of, take that cash out of the LLC. And right. Spend well, it that's just like everything else, right? It, yeah. If you if you use it for personal, then sure. It just be, throws it just throw it on your ten forty, report it. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, and, I don't see this problem. <clears throat> and okay, so if I have it, I have this LLC that's owned by PMA, and I'm just authorized signatory, and I've got a partner in that, like, and so we both take money out. Does that non-reporting? Does it send out ten ninety nines? No, no, never send out a 1099 for from a company that's not filing returns. You'll okay. you'll create a big mess. You you got you'll, it. You, oh but, yeah. there, but there's so. there's no mess to not not reporting it. You're, it's it's actually not a problem at all if you don't report. <laughs> it's when you, you start it. reporting, uh, and, and that's the thing. I mean, it's such a hard thing to get to to accept that uh, a, a company, a corporation, doesn't need to file a tax return. It's when and it's when you file the return, you start seeing the shitstorm because you're gonna. It's going to be a okay. nightmare. I had someone. So that, you don't file a, re, if you don't, not filing returns, mean not filing a 1099, not filing anything. Just. Yeah. Don't do anything. Don't, no W-2s, no 1099s, especially if it's yes, not. You get the tax. 
You get, you get the tax ID number, and that's the last of that entity contacts the IRS. It's purely a, a pass-through holding company, yes. It, it, you don't want to create the tax. If you, especially with an LLC that's aged, and you start filing returns on it, you're going to have problems with the IRS. So make sure that that okay. company is never going to file. Okay. Yeah. I have a, well, I have a small bank here, and I opened up two LLCs and an S-Corp there. And she said, yeah, they check on the website. She never checked anything. All she did was get the EIN number. And I said, okay, I want to open one, one more. I said, get, just get an EIN number. So being the cheap, lazy guy I am, I want to file in New Mexico. You know, 50 okay. bucks and done once. So yeah. I went through it today and did everything except pay. And uh, But I just took an address, any old arbitrary yeah. you know, little shack address and did that. And then for the mailing address, I put my actual business address. Okay. Sure, that's great. That's perfect. Okay. And then, then there were just two questions on there. That one was uh, the limited liability company may carry on its business um, and affairs as a single member LLC. I wrote no. Okay, that's fine. And that was okay. in the articles. No, that's on the that's on the website. The questionnaire uh, you have to go through. You have to go for through the everything. bank or for the secretary no for of state. for the state for secretary yeah, of state. Okay, that's fine. That's fine because okay. whatever you say today can be different tomorrow. Everybody knows that. Okay, this is just like the bank. You write, yeah. You write anything, and this other one says the management of a limited liability company is vested to any extent as a manager, which is kind of weird. But I just wrote no. Just yeah, I like that one. I like to make the member the manager. If you start saying manager, that means outside non-owner, and that just alerts the bank, and they want to ask all kinds of questions. Then same for the IRS. So I always say member owner manager same they're all the same okay this says the management of the limited liability company is vested to any extent in a manager not don't do that no it's, okay. it's vested no only in the members or a member sounds like yeah no gobbledygook there okay so everything's this random address except for the mailing address yeah and by the way it didn't even matter either to have your i mean maybe it's better to have the a local principal address or mailing address but it doesn't really matter because no one's going to look up your company and then send you mail there unless he's trying to sell you something that you don't want but they say <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't let me put only the mailing address would let me be out of state the other one the state was filled in yeah so i understand that, that's correct that's how they're supposed to do it but yeah, it doesn't matter what you put on the charter. I mean, there are some restrictions, but I'm saying you don't need to put an address as if someone's going to look it up and send you mail there. Because when you give someone your address, you're going to give them the address, right? You're just going to say, okay. send it to my company at this address. Yeah. So, if you want to send, you want me to send, send to some random guy in, uh, in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, well, he's yeah. going to get all the uh, mail that you you don't want. He's getting all the attorney letters yeah, and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <Junk too. laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, now this this last one, I, I I don't know if you remember, I spoke to you before. I had a mandatory notice to fill out a survey, and it's for the uh, uh, North Carolina Department of Commerce and Labor. And so they sent me another one and said, you're receiving this letter um, from the North Carolina Department of Commerce and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They have not received your response to verify general business information about your firm. Um and then they have a web ID and they said this this survey is mandatory in accordance with the Employment Security Law of North Carolina, Section GIS 96.4 I1. So I looked that paragraph up okay. and read it. And the, the strongest sentence that I say here is, is the vision may require from an employer any sworn or unswear sworn reports with respect to persons employed by it, which the secretary deems necessary for the effective administration of this chapter, including the employer's quarterly tax wage, et cetera. Um, so they're saying, but is this a law that I have to follow? Because I, 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 my, my books are in order. I'm not worried about it, but I just don't want to participate in their crap. No, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. So I mean, I just, if I were to, if you want to send it to me, I love responding to those. But just off the cuff here, um, I always ask them, who sent you information informing you that I was an employer? How did you acquire that information? <laughs> how do you how did you conclude? What facts are you relying upon to conclude that I'm an employer paying wages? And that doesn't answer the question. I'm just going to start at the beginning. Who are you and how did you get that information? Okay. Are you well, making this is mandatory right here? Look. And Inventory next question, notice. and this is my only other question when you, uh, relating to this, since when is it mandatory that I testify to anything? I 
I'm with you. That's why. Okay, because who am I talking to? That letter is from a, a an executive agency, right? Yes. Okay, guys, listen to what I'm yep. saying now. It, it is. The Secretary of State is an executive agency. Okay. So what are executive agencies? It's the police power of the state. So the police power of the state is telling you that you have to testify under penalty of perjury. I don't think so. <laughs> and that's another issue with the 1040, which, you know, we don't have to get into that. But I'm just saying, that's a, just a, let's call it a red flag, right? It sounds scary. It's like the Wizard of Oz. Oh, well, you know, my, my uh, bookkeeper secretary came in joking about it. She's like in her okay. 70s, but she's like, oh, Mike, it's mandatory. You know, everybody's now, thanks to you, nobody, nobody in my office takes this stuff ser seriously anymore. Good. Oh, <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean so, sometimes you have to do stuff, but in this case, no. I mean, let's say you have to do it. I'm going to ask why. I read the statute. I read your letter, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't appear to me that first of all, I, I want to know where you got information establishing that I have employees. I didn't tell you that I have employees. Maybe that's a trade secret. How'd you get that? And let's start there, and tell me when I'm ever required to testify, and then leave okay. it at that. Well, we've been, we've been, we've been, you know, paying the employee payroll taxes and everything to them for years. So I guess, I guess that's well. How okay, if you're it, doing right? that and you have. But this is a new company, right? No, this is this is for an existing company. If it's for an but existing still company and you're already doing that, well then just go along with it. I thought this was a new okay. company that you've never had that. No, no. Because no, this, I get this, this kind I'm... of letter from Oregon and Kentucky. It, it, yeah, but if you're I, already I mean, do you have employees? Yes. Oh, and this okay. this is a reporting business. Yeah, I have a payment, of course. payment processing business that is not a reporting business that okay, accepts well, all the money and just feeds this see, one as much as it needs. That's the thing. I mean, most of these I set up for people don't have employees. So I'm going to I'm going to yeah. just fool with them and say, how do you know I have employees? Because I know I don't. Right. I never tell them I don't. I just say, where'd you yeah. get that? But in your case, you told them and you do. <laughs> So yeah, well, yeah, but when I set this up 20 years ago, I had no idea who John J. Singleton was. Well, okay, but and you can do that have, now. Now I'm like, where you've been all my life. All right. Well, if you want to change that, what you can do is create another company that deals with it, but you still, I mean, you can outsource no, your I don't, I'm not, I'm not concerned about this in the least. Okay. I just don't it's funny it how they talk to you, right? Off. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's funny how that I, was, I mean, just to just to object, you could write a letter back and say, How dare you talk to me that way? I think you should send me, if you want me my participation in something, I expect a letter from an individual at your office, and I want it to be written politely. Until then, right. I don't want to hear from you. And see what they do. Screw them. Yeah, that's We're right. the parents, right? Let's start telling them how we want to interact. So with I just... Uh... I just wanted your thoughts on that. I'm not, and Tim, this really is no consequence. I could just go participate and forget about it, but uh, that's, yeah, well, I don't want to. Yeah, I, I would have to go along with it because you already, you already did. So, but uh, I kept thinking it was, you know, one of those new companies that has no employees. No, no, I'm sorry. All right. I didn't clarify that. That's all right. No problem. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right, Elaine. So what do you, what's on your mind? Uh, not much. I just yeah. wanted to ask you if I could. <laughs> well, I'm enjoying this conversation very much. <laughs> I always learn. Um, uh, may I also please have the um, information on your partner's uh, crypto exchange? Yeah, um, I will. I, I will get that and send it to you by Telegram. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing, uh, I. Is there like a minimum amount that you have? Thank to you for asking, because I was just going to say he, he doesn't like to deal with like ten thousand dollars and stuff. He, he prefers like the most money, the most money you can, you know, that you can do. And he likes to do single transactions. So I've used him for real estate and things like that. And I found, over, you know, over the time that because I like to try to structure it. And he, I learned that that's not how it's best to work with him and his liaison. Mm -hmm. So you're you're better off if you have like a large don't do like frequent trades. Mm -hmm. exchanges if you're gonna like i only use them maybe once every six months right and it's gonna be over a hundred thousand dollars something like that so just keep that in mind i mean he probably might do something for you if you have forty thousand but make it worth 
Well, yeah, well, I just I just want to know if I have an option there because I, I am with Caleb and Brown, and uh, we're hoping that these cryptos are going to turn around at some point. <laughs> I'm sure but, they will. Um, but yeah. Um, and the other thing was about the vault uh, service that you use. I would imagine they have a minimum also. No, nah, they just have a high premium. <laughs> I, I oh, would okay. I would shop for more. I mean, I've been kind of lazy on that because I don't do use them much, but. Uh, that, that's been my go-to for many situations, even in domestic ones or only in the States. But I think there are better ones now. I think, and probably, I mean, Bullion Star might even have a better deal now because they have more competition. I mean, they were the one of the first I mean, what, what what name did you just say? I couldn't Well, understand. it's called Bullion Star and it's in Singapore. Oh, that's, that's almost right. irrelevant these days because of okay. how we do things. But why, why not use one in the States? I mean, if you do find one in the States, it's not going to be Coinbase. It's going to have to be, you know, a vault service. Um, I don't know who that would be. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I'm well, not, I really I, if, I, if I keep my New Jersey identity up, maybe you would get one in New Jersey. Yeah, keep using that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, try that. I have to do some more research. I mean, there are some interesting places. There's some vault services. There's some in Texas and uh, there's North Dakota. North Dakota is the only, I, I'm sorry. It's, yes, North Dakota. It's the only bank that deals in silver and they only deal in silver. And uh, they have a banking license. They don't deal in fiat. So if they've got a banking license, they're not really just a vault service. I mean, and is that defeating? They're a, banking they're, they're a bank uh, with a vault service, and they only accept precious metals. You cannot send them dollars. Mm. You have to trade your dollars for precious metals and drop ship it to them, and then they'll vault it for you. And they also will pay you uh, like a CD. They'll pay you for using your silver. Like they'll pay you a, what do you call it? A return on your silver. Hmm, that's interesting. How do they use it? You have to go check it out. I mean, it, it, they don't make it convenient, but it, it is a place to store uh, precious metals. Uh, and it is a bank and it's insured. I mean, I think this it's owned by the state. It's a state bank. That's what it is. Oh, it's a North Dakota state bank that is uh, deals only in precious metals. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that one in the Cayman Islands deal with the metals fiat. OK, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if you guys know these places. Um, I'll pass it around. So uh, what is it? SWP Cayman. SWP Cayman dot com. Thank you for that one. Uh, and uh, let's see who was uh, Brett. What did you have? Uh, just a, a follow on to uh, the other guy's comment on um, not filing a return. So I haven't filed a return on the PMA LLC, and we set it up in 2021. But I am getting a 1099 for 250 thousand or so. So it's going to put it on the radar. Any either way, is that a problem or? No, it's not putting on anything on the radar. If you file a return, that puts it on the radar. <laughs> on the radar, let me translate this. So being on the radar means the United States believes that it needs to reconcile accounting. The only way it would know it would think that is if you filed a tax return. If someone reports paying you money on a 1099, okay, and it's paying to the LLC that doesn't file, nothing to reconcile. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't want them to think I had all this money. Obviously there's expenses and employees and all kinds of uh, commissions. And so uh, okay. they don't okay. think no. anything. The IRS does not think anything. It's an accounting system and it has records of things and it will have a record of the money received by the LLC and there will be nothing to it. They will see everything. I, I used to be, I had that concern. I remember back in the nineties when I started doing it for a few people, I mean, I would, I would pull out, I would take a company who's got a regular levy, a dentist office, and I would set up a new company in a week and move all the money over there. And the, and the next week the IRS is calling my client and they're so nice and they want to talk. And they saw what I just did. I'm showing up with my client as his power of attorney and they don't care. What are they going to do? It's an innocent party now <laughs> because I took the future money and I just defeated their ability to levy, but I did it legally. I have the right to do that. I didn't lose my property rights because they were taking my money. <laughs> I just lost some money, you know? So yeah, 
1099s, no problem all day long. Cool. Got it. Thanks. All right. Okay. Well, I appreciate the questions. That's good conversation. I think I'm going to sign off for tonight. Well, what is it? Is it, is it almost the weekend? Yeah, it is. That's why I like Thursday evenings. So that doesn't mean I'm not going to work though. My gosh, I got a few things. You guys keep me busy. So, but it's fun. All right. Well, thanks so much. And uh, I'm going to end it for tonight. Y'all have a nice weekend. Thank you. You too. Right. Thanks, John.